good morning to Sam, Brad, as well as my co-host, Wahida and Lelani. Hopefully you can see them on the screen. Uh, looking forward to a very exciting morning uh, with Sam and Brad. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. I'm going to hand over to the lovely Sam and Brad at this stage. And we hope that you do enjoy this webinar with us this morning. Sam, good morning. Hi, Brad. Morning, morning team and morning everyone. And thank you so much for making time at a busy end of year to come and listen to Brad and my regulatory roundup um, for 2023. Um, some of these things you may have seen some updates in our quarterly regulatory updates or through other engagements that we've had with members. But we hope we're also going to bring you some, some new updates on, on various topics. And really, please, if you do have questions, as mentioned by Bernard, um, please pop those in the Q&A. And we will look to answer as many of those as we can at the end. And if we don't um, have sufficient time to do that, we will um, look to uh, answer those separately and put out a Q&A document um, with, with um, the recording of the session. So without any further ado, I am going to start to share our slides and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Brad, who is going to kick us off with an update um, on the two pots system. Brad, over to you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Thank you, Bernard, our Master of Ceremonies. Just to ensure that all protocols are observed, a morning to all the members. Um, as Sam has stated, this is a very busy time for members who really value and appreciate the time you're taking away from your business and your clients just to sit in and listen to updates from Sam and I. And I think just to, just to uh, kind of provide a bit of context, I think for Sam and I, the hope and prayer and belief is that members will at least have a few light moments once they finish with the session. Um, and a lot of this might be uh, kind of verbatim to you, but we really hope we can shed some life and, and help you progress your business even further. So yeah, I think um, as as per the previous virtual background, Sam and I were surrounded by quite a few coffee cups and mugs and machines and one or two coffee pots. Um, so I guess it really only makes sense for this first update for the session to be on the pot retirement system. I hope you saw what I did there. Um, members may have um, recently seen a significant amount of movement around the new system, whereby last week, in fact, Parliament's Finance Committee decided um, that the system will be implemented on the 1st of March, 2024, and not on the 1st of March, 2025, as previously advised by National Treasury. So both National Treasury as well as industry at large wanted the system implemented during 2025 to enable SARDs and the industry uh, to get systems in place, uh, which they say can only be done once the law has really been promulgated. The emphasis here for FIA members really speaks to the potential advice challenges in the space and the explanation of these various changes and options to your clients. So what will the FIA be doing about this? We are already in the process of submitting our concerns, which has now become even greater in light of the fact that since the 1st of November, when in terms of the final 1 March 2025 was confirmed, most of the industry has actually paused on additional work on the system. In our submission, we, should, we shall also know the industry has not yet seen the final two-part tax bill and will probably only see the final bill during January 2024. We shall again highlight that the crucial system changes for SARS are exactly that crucial, as well as the industry will be dependent on the final legislation. We shall further highlight that the pension fund amendment bill has not yet been tabled, which actually gives effect to the two-part system. And finally, we shall reaffirm National Treasury's support for a longer lead time on the system. So while the FIA does realize that, that this will in the end be a political decision rather than one based on reasonableness, we must still do everything in our power to put a spotlight on reasonable time period required in order for industry to properly prepare itself. So I know that this has been a bit of a mouthful, but I think it's safe to say that all systems go for the two-part system. And so here is a brief mind of what the new system is actually all about. So this regime will implement a two-part system which will allow pension, provenant fund members and retirement annuity policyholders to access a portion of their savings before retirement age to emphasize without resigning. So the system, surprise, surprise, will create two pots, one being the savings pot and the other being the retirement pot. One third of funds contribution after the effective date to be determined will be allocated to the savings pot. Just to confirm, withdrawals from the savings pot can only be made once a year. The other two parts, uh, the other two thirds, I beg your pardon, will go into the retirement pot. The savings component would still remain as a last resort 
once other options have been exhausted. So I'd just like to touch on the workings of the savings platform moment, as well as I believe the knee-jerk reaction is, yes, please, we have access to additional capital once a year. Uh, let's unpack the methodology behind the savings part. Uh, rather than relying on your retirement fund for emergencies, i.e. your children's education, consumers, we believe, should really make sure that they have alternative investments in place. So money can be put away for emergencies in other vehicles, such as notice accounts, or there could be an investment into a tax-free savings account. Bottom line, the savings components of this new system should only be accessed before retirement as a last resort option. Next slide, please, sir. So whilst we await the final legislation, previous slide, I beg your pardon. So whilst we await the final legislation, here are some of the clarifications that were really um, recently provided by National Treasury and SARS. The new proposed uh, proposal for the seed capital is 10% of a member's retirement savings value on the date to be confirmed, once again, to be confirmed, and is limited to a maximum of 30,000. The seed capital reduces members' um, vested components and is transferred to the savings component as the starting balance. Another clarification provided was that National Treasury proposed that the implementation of a withholdings tax process rather than a tax directive process for savings with claims. Should this be approved, SARS will provide, has confirmed that they will provide guidance on the current and appropriate tax regime. Again, based on the current version of the le legislation that we have had sight of, provident fund members who are 55 years or older on the 1st of March, 2021, will be able to opt into the two-part system. In other words, the two-part system will not automatically apply to these members as they will have a choice, which is super important. In terms of the cash lump sum withdrawals from the savings component after the effective date, including seized capital, will be taxed at a member's marginal rate It is if it is withdrawn before retirement. So on one hand, we have this huge two-part retirement system that seeks to ensure that we are financially supported and covered when we reach retirement age. And on the other side, we have a similar regime change that seeks to provide universal access to quality healthcare for South Africans. I'll now hand over to Sam to share insights as to what has been happening in the health space at the FIA headquarters. Thanks, Brad, thanks for that update. I think probably amongst our members, there's going to have to be a serious amount of work done to understand all the different layers to this two-part system and the level of advice that is going to be needed to be given to members to understand with ultimately all the different pots that are going to exist with the previous regimes already in place. And as you quite rightly mentioned um, at the outset, we don't actually even know what the final legislation is going to look like. Great. And we will look in the new, new year, once that legislation has been finalized, look to prepare another webinar for members to help support them through their advice journey with members. And now moving on to NHI, again, another one, last two weeks, um, a lot of noise, a um, lot of disconcerting noise, um, I think, for us as the FIA. Um, we have made substantive um, submissions on the NHI, um, really since the inception of the bill. Um, we have had members um, actively presenting at the provincial public, public hearings over the last few months. And I think as mentioned by Brad, I mean, we are absolutely, as the FIA, in support of universal health coverage. Um, we absolutely believe in a more equitable and improved health system. However, we have a number of concerns around the proposals in the existing bill, as we have mentioned in previous sessions, specifically the abolishment of the private medical schemes, as well as the single, single funding pot. And as part of our submissions and our proposals, we really have um, provided alternatives as to what a desired healthcare system should look like, what are the various barriers to leveraging universal healthcare. Um, we know that there have been a number of proposals and, and um, transitional me measures and pilots that have been put in place and that actually haven't been allowed to run to fruition to enable us to see what does and doesn't work practically um, from from some of those proposals that have been put forward. Um, we recognize that a private scheme is a national asset, um, and we do not believe that it would be constitutional um, to abolish these entire, entirely. No other jurisdiction in the world is it permitted to um, only have a national health insurance system. So also as part of our submission, um, 
very kindly and as a, as a result of, of the support of a sub-working group of our health exco, we put together um, a line-by-line -line response to each of the provisions in the bill as well as the changes to the subordinate legislation. So you will have seen, um, unfortunately, in the last week or two, that seven of the eight provinces have voted in favor of the bill as it currently stands. I note in press this morning that the Western Cape has finally come out and put its foot down and completely rejected the bill. Business has also come out and completely rejected elements of the bill that they've raised challenges on previously and indicated that government should, be, should not be rushing to implement these proposals without serious consideration of some of the issues raised. Um, in terms of the way forward, we have also been very actively working with Business Unity South Africa, BUSA, um, in terms of some of these larger elements, as I mentioned, the abolishment of private medical schemes, as well as the single funding pot. And we are going to be engaging with them over the next days and weeks around what the next steps are in terms of a possible um, constitutional challenge with regard to some of these issues. And as we progress forward in those engagements with BUSA, and with the industry at large, we will keep members um, appraised. I think, you know, there's also again in the press been much concern about the abolishment of the tax credits. And while certainly there is provision for that within the bill, there is specific legislation that would have to be amended in order to give effect to many of those changes. So this is never going to be a quick process. It's never going to be a one year journey. As with many of the other things that we're seeing, we recognize that next year is an election year. And so certain decisions are being taken with that in mind, but there are a great number of steps and changes and processes that need to be followed before this, this takes effect. And we will be working continually to ensure that both for our members and for South Africans as a whole, we achieve the best possible outcome. Um, I'm next going to move on to low cost benefit options. I think this is also relevant because it has um, formed a large part of the discussion around NHI and what options are available for the broader South African market. Currently, the, the government and, and, and certain powers that be believe that private medical healthcare is exclusive and only accessible to the wealthy. And so there have been proposals on the table for a number of years with regard to the low cost benefit options. We do also know that two years ago, the Council for Medical Schemes proposed to reduce the healthcare commission on the demarcation products from 20% to 3% in line with other medical scheme products. And we are pleased to say that a result of our successful lobbying, that proposal was pushed out to 1 March, 2024. Um, we know that engagements around low cost benefit options and also prescribed minimum benefits are continuing. And we have um, members who participate on those working committees at the council. And we really do believe that that um, deadline of 1 March is again going to be extended because we have not seen any final versions of what those low cost benefit um, options are, are going to, to, to look like. We did recently meet with the Council for Medical Schemes. Unfortunately, they are less forthcoming than some of our other regulators and just have indicated that they're looking to present everything to the minister um, before issuing to public. So we'll watch this space and again, um, really keeping keeping members updated as, as we progress. Also then moving on, and I'm going to hand over to Brad for this one, an update on the Employment Equity Amendment Act, what we've been doing, where we are today, um, and what member responsibilities are at the current time. Brad, over to you. Thank you, Sam. Some, some really solid work uh, with regard to NHI uh, from our members who participated in those provincial legislature hearings. So again, a thank you to those members who volunteered for that exercise. So uh, members will be reminded that the FIA submitted extensive commentary on the Employment Equity Amendment Act during June 2023. This followed constructive engagement with other financial services, trade uh, associations or organizations such as CISA, BASA, SAIA, uh, as well as via BUSA, uh, and of course, directly with the Department of Employment and Labor, DAL itself. Whilst the actual Employment Equity Amendment Bill was signed into law by the, by the President, hence now referring it um, as an act, the date of promulgation of the act has not yet been set. This means that the DAL can therefore not publish the actual regulations which contains those sectoral employment equity targets. Um, you know, in, in the process of Sam and I chatting uh, about prepping for, for the session, and specifically this side, we thought it was really important to actually kind of manage expectations of our members 
uh, and provide clarity on, well, what we do right now uh, until we know the effective dates of this legislation. So I think I've got a bit of mental telepathy for some of the members. Uh, the DOM recently confirmed that, em that employers are required to report on their 2023 obligations or targets under the existing Employment Equity Act, even though these, even though the amended Employment Equity Act has been signed into law. Some of you may be aware, I hope and pray and assume, that Employment uh, Equity 2023 manual and online report periods opened on Friday, the 1st of September 2023, with manual reporting having been due on the 2nd of October 2023. However, the online submit for your EE reporting, uh, that deadline is the 15th of January 2024. It is fully expected that upon proclamation of the effective dates of the Amendment Acts and the Amendment Regulations, the final employment equity targets will be published for implementation. Flowing from this, as opposed to waiting for this date and hoping for better days, the FIA really continues to encourage members to commence with their own diversity and inclusion strategies so that you can start creating that pipeline of talent for you to use within your own business. And to either kick out those discussions within your business or to complement your existing strategy, I'll hand over to Sam to really get members feeling excited, encouraged, and hopeful. Thanks, Brad. And I actually am excited. I really, really am. Um, we have been working probably mm, since the end of 2022 on trying to support our members um, through their transformation journeys. We understand that the legislation is complex. We understand, especially for smaller businesses who may not have huge, big HR departments or big teams, and even for those teams, just sometimes the complexities and knowing what to do and having ideas around implementing the changes within their business can be a real, real challenge when you're simply trying to do your day job. Um, we all recognize how important diversity, equity, inclusion, and transformation is for society as a whole and for South Africa in particular. And so we started um, using the services of BizArmor and uh, conducted a number of surveys um, across members to try and understand where they sit in terms of their understanding of the legislation, what's expected of them, depending on the size of their business, are they a small business, are they a medium-sized business, are they a large business, which parts of the financial sector codes apply to them, which don't, what are they required to do in terms of reporting, and then what are possible things that you can think about in your business? Small steps to, to transform um, and things that you might not be aware of. You know, everybody is, oh, well, I must have 51% black ownership of my business or I, you know, need to sell my business or I need to have a certain number of um, black colored Indian um, employees. But actually, there are multiple things that you can do within your business. And what we have done through this guideline is, A, try to simplify some of the complexity, B, try and help you understand what your obligations are, and then put together a series of different uh, suggestions of things to think about in your businesses that can help you transform. And sometimes it isn't even just about what you do in your own business. It's about what you maybe do in your community and your local area that can help you score points. If you're a small, if you're a small business, that may be the only way because you haven't got room to start to employ other people in your business. How do you support the communities, run education programs? Um, how do you volunteer? So we've really tried to, to, to look at every different angle and we really are excited about this guideline. Um, I'm pleased to say that the final draft went to our Transformation Exco yesterday. Um, they have an opportunity to review it and provide comments, and then we will look to finalize it, and then we will be printing it and sharing it as a booklet with all of our members in, in the new year. And I really do hope um, that you engage with it, that you get a lot of benefit from it. We have put an inordinate amount of work into making it something practical um, and tangible um, for our members. And for those who have participated and supported us in the surveys and in, in the smaller workshops that we've had with Biz Armor to get us to where we are today, we are so grateful. Um, we can't, and, and we say this all the time, and Brad mentioned about the members who supported us at the NHI hearings, we cannot do what we do without our members and your support. So thank you very, very much. I'm then gonna move on to, to Kofi. Um, lot, a lot from me um, at this particular juncture. And really, um, I think just the update is there's been a lot of hype around the fact that we are probably going to see the bill tabled in Parliament at the end of this year. Um, 
I can truly say that that ship has sailed. Um, the cut off for any submissions to par Parliament um, passed a little while ago, and um, so we won't, we do not expect uh, to see that um, until until the new year, um, maybe sooner rather than later. But um, our last engagements with Treasury and the FSC have indicated that it could possibly even only be after um, the elections. So we are still watching that space. But for those of you who obviously have not seen any iterations of the bill um, since 2020, that doesn't mean that there have not been substantial changes made to the bill um, behind the scenes um, subsequent to that public consultation. There have been extensive engagements through NEDLAC, and we have been fortunate enough to participate in those engagements through our membership of Business Unity South Africa, BUSA. Um, and we... We know that there have also been, there's been a lot of input from the social partners. There's been extensive input, particularly from ASISA around the um, collective investment schemes provisions. So ultimately what we will see tabled in parliament will be quite different from what, what you have last seen, but certainly in terms of what we have last um, taken into account, um, I'm pleased to say that quite a lot of the, the input that we have included had, had made had been taken into account. Um, and, and we look forward to seeing that final version. I think for me, the key messages are, are really um, not to panic, as we've told you all previously, this is going to be a very, very long implementation and transition period. First of all, that bill has to go through the whole parliamentary process. It has to be reviewed, it has to be approved. Um, whether it stays in the form that's submitted to parliament or not, again, remains to be seen. And then ultimately, all once the bill becomes an act, all the existing pieces of legislation will need to be repealed and replaced by conduct standards. And every single one of those conduct standards will have to be issued for public consultation and reviewed and considered. Um, we do know that they, the FSTA, and I was really pleased to hear this, have been looking at consideration of a model like is implemented in the UK, which is a handbook, which has common um, chapters that apply to all regulated institutions and then separate chapters that apply to particular types of, of licenses. And uh, having worked in that environment myself, um, it is in a very effective model. So I'm hoping it's one that they follow as opposed to the Namibian model, which is looking at 157 different individual conduct standards, which doesn't appeal to me, even though it will keep me in a job. Um, and I'm sure all the other compliance officers. Um, so we are waiting, waiting to see. The FSC have indicated probably a six-year transition period. I mean, there's got to be relicensing. Everybody's got to submit transformation plans. There's going to be a huge amount of work to do. Um, my personal view is that, that it's going to be a lot longer than that. Um, but just finally, to say that Ronald King, um, our vice president and chair of our regulatory exco, and myself have been also nominated to the FSCA's um, uh, uh, Kofi Transition Working Group, and which will be supporting the industry on its journey towards um, full implementation. Um, that will look at sort of sectors initially, and then we will drill down and bring other participants into those working groups as we become more granular and start to get more discipline specific. But we will keep members appraised of that journey. We are waiting to have um, the first meeting of that committee. And I think that's been a lot of my voice for now, Brad. So I'm going to hand back over to you to chat a little bit about FICA and to tell us about what has been happening, I mean, since the dire grey listing of South Africa and what feels to me in all my years at the FIA <laughs> is literally every other day I'm getting a publication from the FSCA that's AML related, anti-money laundering related, or from the FIC. Um, you know, I sent you some stuff this morning so our members can look out for that where it's hot off the press, so we won't be telling you about that one today, but watch out for it in the newsletter. But it's coming fast and furious, Brad. So can you give us a bit of an update? Thank you, Sam. I think before I move on to something as sexy as FICA and the FIC, just again a request, because I know Sam is way more kind than I. With regard to Kofi, you know, in, in order for us to really achieve outcomes that speaks to members and better outcomes for you, when Sam and I start sending out the various 512,000 calls for comment on the various standards, please engage with us. Please pop us an email, Brad, Sam, we have no idea what this means for our business or does this mean X? Because that way Sam and I can be empowered to really shape legislation that is most most appropriate for your business. So over on to something as sexy as, as the grade listing and, and, and the FIC. Uh, just to take a step back in terms of that grade listing, during February 2023, uh, the Financial Action Task Force 
uh, took the decision to include South Africa on its green list, thereby classifying South Africa as a jurisdiction under increased monitoring. So what is grey listing? Grey listing is a practice where a country with serious anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing deficiencies is, public, is publicly identified and subjected to increased monitoring by the Financial Action Task Force. So what does this mean for the FIC, the financial intelligence sector, and the FIA members? Um, as Sam has, has uh, stated earlier, members may have seen a significant amount of communication issued and webinars hosted by the FIC, of which um, the FIA, FIA shared where appropriate with members, hence the 512 emails from Sam and myself. Uh, the FIA naturally wants to work with the regulators to ensure our members are aware of and understand their duties and obligations in the space. During September 2023, uh, the FIA facilitated a webinar for members whereby FSCA presented an update on anti-money laundering and countering of the finance of terrorism. So what I'll just uh, go through are a few examples of either free webinars or public compliance communications issued since June 2023 alone. Uh, so in recent days, the FI has received a number of queries from members regarding communication from a service provider named Management or Manage Integrity Evaluation, MIE, contacting members to arrange for the taking of their fingerprints without any context clarity. A refresher for members, during last month, uh, the FI shared and explained FECA Communication 27 of 2023, which advised the industry that the FAA, uh, FSCA, I beg your pardon, will be initiating the process to verify certain information about financial institutions, including criminal records of specific individuals. MIE was actually appointed to undertake the verification of records, such as qualifications and criminal, rec criminal records on behalf of the FSCA. So after Sam um, and myself raised the current approach with uh, that MAE has taken with the FSCA, the FSCA advised that MIE were actually asked to revise their communication to the impacted individuals and to actually re reflect that this request came from the FSCA, the regulator. So now you have a bit more context around any respective requests you receive from MIE. Uh, one of the free webinars provided or hosted by the FIC related um, to amendments to the FIC Act, schedules and regulations. This provided insights, a big part into the updates to certain schedules of FICA, updates to the money laundering and terrorist uh, finance and control regulations in relation to cash threshold reporting and international fund transfer reports, as well as the general laws, this is a bit of a mouthful, anti-money laundering and combating terrorist financing amendment act. So again, a free webinar by the FIC just to ensure that all affected parties are aware of duties, roles and responsibilities. Another free webinar on targeted financial sanction obligations, reporting and delisting was provided by the FIC. This provided insights on the amendments related to targeted financial sanctions, the obligations related to targeted financial sanctions, as well as regulatory reporting. Further, PCCIB also provided guidance on how to acquire login credentials by any other business that may not necessarily be an accounting institution, but which has a suspicious and unusual transaction reporting obligations in terms of FICA. So I know uh, what, what we don't want to do is put the fear of God into members, but I think just as, this is just to create awareness of whether your business could be uh, uh, impacted, what you can do in the event that you come across something, inverted comma, a bit shady, here are free webinars that the FIC hosts just to provide you with a bit of in insights. I just want to say it must be further noted that failure by accountable institutions to register with the FIC or failure to provide uh, an update on any information may lead to administrative sanctions. Most recently, last week to be exact, um, the FIC issued draft PC121 uh, for, consult for consult consultation with comment due by Friday the 8th of December. The draft PCC actually provides guidance on the definition of beneficial ownership, which is quite a hot, uh, I think, item or kind of naming convention of the last few years, and is aimed at highlighting money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing risks relating to beneficial owners. And that is all things FICA related for this um, coffee session. Thanks, Brad, and, and thanks for that update. I think, you know, just with regard to that FSCA communication 27 of 2023, um, when um, members raised their concerns about their approach from MIE um, to them with regard to the criminal um, checks, uh, outside of the, the fact that they weren't given context and, and reference to the request from the FSCA, there was some question around legality. Please note that, number one, um, 
the powers for the FSCA to uh, collect this information and to check this information are given to them under the Financial Sector Regulation Act. And in addition, being subject to the provisions of FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, and our wish and our need and our desire to get South Africa removed from the grey list. We do need to participate in these activities and we do need to ensure that our members align themselves with the obligations and the requirements prescribed um, so that we can get off that list um, sooner rather than later. We appreciate the frustrations um, and the challenges and the e extra intrusion, but it is really in South Africa's best interest for us to get off this list. So we will continue to share these communications with you, remind you of the webinars being offered by the FIC. Um, they are good. They're of high quality. They're a good standard, um, important things to know. And for those uh, only non-life members here who think that they are completely absolved from any obligations on the FIC, please remember that you do have reporting obligations in terms of suspicious activity um, and you know, suspicious transaction reporting. So in the event that you encounter anything that is of concern, those obligations do apply to you and you are required to report. Um, Brad, it's you still. Um, and you're going to give us an update on the draft phase on the council rules. Even something more delicious than fake. Thank you, Sam. So the, the Ombud Council recently issued the draft Ombud Council rules for the Ombud for Financial Services provided, the draft rules for clients. So a bit of background before we get into insight of the actual draft rules. So the Ombud Council and the FSCA decided that it is more appropriate for the Ombud Council to take responsibility for the content of the phase Ombud rules as Ombud Council rules. The Ombud Council has therefore made new Ombud Council rules for the Ombud for Financial Service Providers to replace the previous phase Ombud rules. The draft really updates both the maximum compensation amount that the phase Ombud may award and further provides or proposes, I beg your pardon, other changes to the previous phase Ombud rules aimed at removing outdated references and clarifying certain procedural and jurisdictional matters. The draft rules differ from the previous rules in the following respects. Outdated references, references are being upon to the board being the former Financial Services Board are replaced with references to the authority being the FSCA. Definitions of and cross-referencing to the Financial Sector Regulation Act, FSR, are provided for and certain term terminology is updated to align with terminology used in the FSR Act. References to the Office of the Phase Ombud um, as distinct from the Phase Ombud are no longer used. The sequence of provisions of the rules has been changed to group provisions more logically and actually improves the rules. Um, Sam, I must be honest, when I first read the draft rules, even I was impressed at the logical flow of how they were uh, set out and really appeared to me easy to understand and digest. So that's just a cheeky pun from my side. Absolutely agree, Brad. Absolutely. And I think that it's been, it's been a long time coming. Um, so I think certainly um, we didn't have substantive feedback in, in terms of, of those proposals. And I think what we look forward to seeing is the advent of the single ombud system coming into play from 2024 and how these, these new rules will play out, out under that structure. Absolutely. Just before I proceed, it's amazing how you can achieve the same objectivities or, or goals by keeping it simple and straight to the point. <laughs> Agreed, which is <laughs> can't often be said for legislation. I'm so glad this is a safe space. Uh, <laughs> now, with respect, now with respect to uh, specific provisions uh, of the draft uh, rules, these include complaints within jurisdiction, complaints related to persons not authorized as SPs, attempted resolution with the respondent, oral complaints, respondent timelines. Consequences of failing to cooperate with the Ombud, I think that's quite interesting, as well as a reconsideration of decisions. And finally, the compensation limit increase. So the rule increases the draft rules, I beg your pardon, increases the amount of compensation the phase Ombud may award for damages from, a, from the current maximum of 800,000 Rand in the previous rules to a maximum of 3.5 million Rand. FIA members might be asking why the, why the sudden increase, I beg your pardon. So the Ombud Council agreed with the FSCA statement that the proposed limit uh, is appropriate when considering factors such as the market realities of consumers' risk exposure and the fact that a very low financial limit for awards to complaints actually jeopardizes the restitution outcome of determinations. Again, it's, it's hard not to uh, agree with the methodology or that the line of thinking. The Ombud Council was in agreement with the recommendation by, made by the World Bank Group that the maximum compensation limit for the phase Ombud, which was set in 2000 and four at 800,000 should be reviewed. 
Further, in terms of how did we get to that 3.5 million mark, the World Bank Group highlighted that index, the South African CPI, that would have been, would have been equivalent to an excess of 2 million rand in 2020, that many stakeholders, surprise, surprise, has, has raised the fact that this limit applicable to the phase orbit is low. So now members have a better understanding of where this 3.5 million uh, mark came from. So in summary, uh, we welcome these draft changes and look forward to future changes. So does the draft rules really speak to complaints handling and FSP's interaction with clients in that regard? I think it sets the scene for an insanely appropriate and relevant update that has been taking place in the world of cover subjectivity and grid exclusions. As you know, again, these may very well result in situations where you, uh, you know, are fi find yourself being in the middle of client complaints and interpretations in terms of clauses, wordings, and terms and conditions. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, I mean, we we sort of, the end of last year, we had a flurry of, of concerns raised um, by members with the number of grid exclusions being introduced by members. And in addition to that, we were seeing some changes in the large commercial space um, where there were large uh, multi peril policies. And as opposed to the historic position of um, providers following the lead insurer, every insurer were implementing their own provisions and exclusions, which was causing huge challenges from an advice process and from an, um, a, a claims and, and um, sort of explaining to clients um, exactly all the differences across the different providers in that network. So we started engaging with the regulator in January 2023. Um, they were very much alive to the issues that we were raising with them, obviously the multiple changes, um, the risk to consumers, the risk to advisors as a consequence of, of you know, needing to keep up with advising their clients on multiple changes and very, very different provisions across um, policies, as well as, I mean, for <laughs> the lack of clarity in relation to a lot of the wording. Um, I think in, in some instances, we found that, that insurers didn't even quite know what their wording meant in the event of a claim and what it didn't, didn't exclude. So um, we... Again, we gave the regulator opportunity to, 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 to walk away and look at this. We had tried also to engage through SAIA, but due to com competition concerns, they had been uh, uh, worried about engaging as an industry. And hence, we, we had taken the matter to the regulator. We um, further engaged with them um, in August. And as I mentioned up front, they really are aligned to the issues and, and challenges. They are aligned to the impact on consumers. And they have undertaken a process to get their own legal opinion um, on the competition issues, um, simply that they didn't want to be biased by somebody else's legal opinion, and they want to ensure that we take the matter forward um, appropriately. And I think the discussion really extended to look at other aspects, not simply the cover subjectivity, not the grid exclusions, but all the types of contentious issues that we will look to see as, as times progress around possibly cybersecurity, climate risks, and the like. And what they asked the FIA to do was to put together a proposal on what we felt um, the ultimate uh, solution would be to this, which we did. And really that is based on looking at an approach used in the UK, which is the London um, market wordings. And those are standard wordings that are developed and prepared by trade associations within that space um, to allow a common standard they are not prescribed not everyone has to follow them but they are deemed to be the common market practice so we have just followed up with the regulator we know that they were looking to receive that opinion um, and as soon as they've got that we're looking to engage further um, sadly and uh, this will be probably quite an, a protracted process but we are engaging actively and we do um, intend to progress this um, well into the new year to try and alleviate some of the burdens and the challenges um, for, for members uh, on, on this. And we will keep you posted uh, as we as we progress. Um, Brad, um, now moving on to our cross-sectoral conduct of business returns and Omni-CBRs. Again, this is something you and I put in an ordinate amount of work into. We called for a lot of comments from industry. Um, there was a big flurry and fuss and then radio silence. So where are we now? Absolutely, Sam. I mean, gee whiz, because I think if we ever, not to exaggerate, when you and I started on this journey, I had a fringe and look at me now. So, I mean, you know, here we go. So I think- Did you I have just, a way uh, with words, Brad? 
I mean, it's uh, Omni CBR. We need to keep it sexy, Sam. Um, I think taking a step back and just, uh, you know, uh, we need to revisit the purpose behind the cross sectoral conduct of business return, Omni CBR. Um, and Omni CBR was really uh, intended to facilitate a streamlined cross sectoral reporting and sets out types of conduct indicators that will be. Uh, that will need to be reported on in future by financial institutions, which include the banks, insurers, FSPs, as well as retirement funds, amongst other stakeholders in our sector. In terms of the specific themes around which information will be requested by these returns, these include the governance of your business, complaints handling processes, conflicts of interest, movement of money within your business and out of your business, as well as business composition. So in terms of the proposed court reporting requirements, um, yes, you heard correct, every quarter. This uh, stringent requirement has already been highlighted by the FIA amongst our myriad of concerns, comments and questions to the FSCA in response to the initial request for comment. In terms of the then proposed rollout of the Omni-CBR, the FSCA initially advised that the rollout and implementation of the Omni-CBR would consist of four phases of a four year period, starting from June, 2022, all the way to June 2026. The intention was that phase one during 2022 would be the consultation of the CBR with the sector. Phase two during 2023 would be the industry pilot rollout to assess systems and the operational impact. Phase three, which is uh, envisioned to have taken place during 2024, was the two year transitional reporting. And the initial phase four uh, rollout plan was aimed to take place during 2026. And that was really finally the full and final statutory reporting on a quarterly basis again. So following industry consult the industry consultation process, the FA made a comprehensive submission with regard to the proposed returns. Subsequent to this, the FA confer confirmed that they are revisiting the returns and a new version will be issued for, consult for consultation towards April, 2024, with the pilot commencing thereafter. How, how should um, FIA members become involved? Please, this is this is not a request. This is the big need and prayer. Uh, as always, we encourage members to participate and engage. Not only as will inform yourselves of what is coming down the line for you, but will also provide uh, allow for you to provide input, which would actually influence the outcome again for you. While Sam and I were actually preparing for the section uh, for the session, Sam reminded me of an amazing explanation of the importance of member participation in this process uh, that was actually provided by one of FIA's past regional directors uh, during one of our recent FIA roadshow events in Cape Town. And it went along the lines of this, an hour of your time towards participation in the pilot process will save you hours of quarterly reporting exercise as proposed by the FIA. So those additional hours required to complete the re quarterly reporting, looking at an overarching range of components in your business could be valuable time away from your clients and that's your business. So just before members start rolling your eyes at this tsunami of compliance information and unsexy regulatory updates, our next theme really speaks to the natural evolution of the financial services sector, both in terms of product and service offering together with protection, uh, both for your business as well as your clients. Open finance, also very sexy. Uh, open finance is a data sharing model where people provide financial data from banking and other sources with third party providers. This framework allows for the sharing customer permissioned financial data by FSPs, by FSP third party providers who can then use this data to develop innovative products and services. Data sharing with open finance refers to financial shared data, which may be used, which may be the customer's personal registration or identification information at the financial institution or customer information produced by financial institutions in relation to that customer's financial products. This includes instances whereby you are providing personalized financial services to customers based on financial data that was obtained through application program interfaces, APIs, or screenscaping. An example before members completely um, kind of throw their hands up, an example of open finance, this would be an investment application that allows financial customer information to be drawn from all financial institutions the customer deal with. Example, banks, insurers, and investment managers and then provides a single interface for the customer to get a better understanding of their expenses and behaviors that might be sabotaging their efforts to budget and invest. So again, you must think, Brad, what is traditional finance? If you just explain open finance, traditional finance, really in traditional finance, banks and other financial institutions control customer data and services. Whereas with open finance, customer service, customers are big part and can give permission to share their financial data with third party providers. 
So when FSP only provides financial services to customers based on traditional sources of information, example, application forms, consultation with customers, et cetera, these are not considered open finance services or activities. With respect to the recent FSCA information request to open finance, during 2023, the FSCA published a draft position paper on open finance. Members are reminded of a prior communication from the FIA on open finance, where we include an actual summary of the draft position paper prepared by the FIA. The FSCA then embarked on an information gathering exercise to consider the uptake usage and practices by financial institutions that participate in open finance. The objective of that finding was really to assist the FSCA in shaping the final position paper on open finance. So as we remain on this fourth industrial revolution FinTech innovation theme, I'll now pass the virtual baton over to Sam for an item that may be even more exciting for members to be made aware of cybersecurity. Thanks, Brad. And I think it's quite topical. I mean, talking about open Absolutely. finance, I know from my perspective, I think it is actually exciting for us as consumers. Um, I think it opens a lot of doors to not duplicating our information, how we share it, where we share it. Um, there's a one-stop view of, of you as a customer if you give that consent. But ultimately, I would be concerned, and I know that the regulators are concerned, about the security of data. Um, so which kind of brings me on to, as you say, quite naturally, cyber security and cyber resilience. And, you know, this is really something um, that is important for the whole industry, um, especially considering that cyber attacks are one of the greatest risks to South Africa. Until grid failure took the number one spot, cyber attacks were the number one risk to South Africa. They're now sitting at number two. And we are currently looking at solutions on how to better support members through the journey. We understand a lot of it's technical. We're not all tech gurus, but there are basic steps um, that members can take to really support themselves and their customers um, through um, uh, the, the, the sort of cyber protection journeys. I think what's also worth noting is that the Prudential Authority and the FSCA have just published Joint Standard 1 of 2023 um, information technology governance and risk management. Um, it specifically applies to banks and insurers and collective investment scheme um, uh, and discretionary investment managers. And so many of our members will be sitting here going, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. That doesn't matter. What is the relevance? And I think it's important to note that, you know, good IT governance, um, both for yourselves and for your customers, um, is of fundamental importance. The one regulator who has been issuing fines is the regulator um, in terms of data protection breaches, and this all falls under that ca category. You will have seen the recent press around uh, a possible um, attack at TransUnion. TransUnion have indicated that they have checked all their systems and they do not believe there have been attacks, but particularly co considering how much data TransUnion holds um, of every single one of us, um, we want to ensure that they have got the appropriate controls in place to make sure that somebody isn't getting hold of our data and, and misappropriating, misusing, and abusing it. So moving back to the joint standard, as I mentioned, it's um, specifically uh, uh, applicable to, to banks and insurers and um, uh, um, uh, discretionary investment managers. But where you have binders in place and where you have outsourcing arrangements in place with any of those entities, they are going to expect you to ensure that you meet the obligations of those standards. So familiarize yourselves with them, look at them, consider them. They really are looking at all the minimum requirements and principles that need to be implemented to protect your business, taking into account the nature, say, size, scale and complexity of your business. So these are really, really important um, elements to look at. And we just can't encourage you more um, to, to, to consider that standard. Obviously, smaller businesses, you know, you need to think about things. Even Minecraft, protecting your emails, making sure they can't be intercepted. Um, these are all important things and, and really will save a lot of money in, in the long run um, in the event of a, a, some kind of data breach or, or, or security attack. And as I say, we are hoping to, to keep you posted into 2024 on some possible solutions for you as the FIA. And that really um, is sort of us, it for Brad and I today. Um, we are very tight on time. I am just going to remind everybody of our fantastic CPD platform. Um, we are currently in the process of adding even more hours, as we've indicated to members. We've entered into agreement with the Institute of Health Risk Managers to add some more health content. 
We're also adding some more general industry content and some more non-life content and through into the new year. We're also going to be looking to partner with some other providers on some discretionary investment management and um, life or, or financial planning content um, as, we, as we go forward. Um, but really are excited that we are getting those hours up for you. And so please do look for our updates um, from us as we as we take those those forward. Um, I'm going to stop by sharing. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to hand over to the rest of our team to see if there are any questions um, from the floor that maybe Brad and I can assist with while we are here. Bernard Wags. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Brad. Um, we do have two questions. I see my colleague Brad has been answering uh, the members in in the session as well but jennifer fuller asks can insurers charge a compulsory premium for power surge cover no option of not taking the cover it sounds like conditional selling to me don't know who'd like to answer that one sam it looks like you have an answer already yeah i i don't i don't specifically have an answer i mean i think that that issue around conditional selling um is an interesting one and i think one we would probably bring to the table i suppose you know, at the end of the day, and we've said it to members before, um, brokers speak with their feet. So if you are not comfortable with that proposal from a particular insurer, then I would suggest you go and look at the wider market and see what else is available to you. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, with, with issues at the moment and some of the considerations around risk management that we are seeing from some of the international regulators, Particularly um, what we've seen from, from some of the regulators in Europe is that where you've got issues of a lot of flood or a lot of fire damage or things that are happening re regularly, they are putting compulsory provisions into their policies as part of their risk mitigation processes. So, you know, I think we probably need to look at these things in the context. Um, it's often hard to, to respond without specific context. But as I say, um, brokers speak with their feet. So um, there are other options um, out there in the marketplace where that is, is, is not the issue. And, and those are the things that you have to consider for your, for your client. Um, B, anything else? Uh, I think that was well answered. So we are good, good feedback there. And I, I like that brokers speak with their feet. I see Brad is typing, but let's take this one live. Uh, Leon Swart says, open finance. Does it include when we do credit vetting on non-life policies? Well, I'm happy to handle that, B. Um, interesting uh, question. I think, you know, as uh, this open finance animal spider diagram starts to develop, these types of queries are going to start to pop up. As, uh, actually, there's no um, tick box in terms of open finances one, two, three, and traditionals X, Y, Z. That being said, you know, my knee jerk reaction that Leon's scenario really uh, speaks to, to traditional finance, as an FSP really only provides financial service where Open finance is whereby an FSP only provides financial services to customers based on traditional sources of information. In my mind, I would classify a credit vetting of non-life policy as a traditional kind of source of information. But I'm also happy to take this offline with the FSCA just to get clarity, just to ensure that you are on the mark. So I'll revert to you offline, Leon. Yeah, I think awesome. at this stage, their thinking hasn't expanded yet to determine everything that would be covered. We know at this stage that they um, sort of primary area that they would look at would be banking um, and then only into ex expanding into the broader sectors going forward. So it might not be something that they would be considering up front. I think they're at the very, very conceptual stages um, in terms of considering what that would look like. And that would probably be something that would be further down the line. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Those were the two burning questions. The rest, Brad and colleagues have been answering. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll end us off by saying, wow, <laughs> the, all the acronyms, um, all the fancy words, I actually even, you know, working and seeing these things more regularly, perhaps than some, um, I, I learned a lot today still. And as a consumer as well, you know, it's very interesting. So thank you, Sam and Brad, for taking us through um, what I believe to be a, a very understandable way of talking about these very critical issues. And I wrote them all down, Tupot, NHI, LCBO, EEA, Transformation Guidelines, Kofi, FICA, all 512 emails, Brad, Ombud Council Rules, Grid, grid Exclusions, Omni CBR, 
open finance and cybersecurity. That is a mouthful. So thank you for explaining it to us in a way that even I can understand um, and get excited about it. And yes, Brad, it can be sexy when you talk about it the way that you and Sam do. So thank you from, from our side. And I'm hoping I'm, I'm thanking you on behalf of all our uh, attendees today. So that is it for us for uh, Coffee with Sam and Brad.